I'd like to call the Village of Riverside Board of Trustees regular meeting to order for Thursday, March 17th, 2022. We'll start by the Pledge of Allegiance, which will be led tonight by the Scouts. Will the audience please rise? And will Cub Scouts please salute? Color Guard, prepare the colors. Color Guard, advance. Color Guard, prepare to post the colors. Color Guard, post the colors. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two. Will the scouts please join me in saying the scout oath? On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country, to obey the scout law, to help other people at all times, and to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. Will the scouts please join me in saying the scout law? A scout is trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Two, color guard, return to ranks. Audience, please be seated. Thank you, Troop 24. Ethan, would you please call the roll? President Ballerin. Here. Trustee Pollock. Here. Trustee Marshazia. Here. Trustee Galagos. Here. Trustee Hannon. Here. Trustee Evans. Here. Trustee Clarity. Here. Village Manager Francis. Here. Village Attorney Mars. Here. Also present, Village Clerk Soul. Thank you. First on my present president's report is a proclamation honoring Riverside Cub Stout PAC 24. Trustee Clarity, would you please? A proclamation honoring Riverside Cub Scout PAC 24. Whereas the Boy Scouts of America, founded in 1910 and granted a federal charter in 1916, is the largest youth organization in the United States. And whereas in 1930, the Boy Scouts of America began registering the first Cub Scout packs for boys ages 8 to 11. And whereas in January of 1951, Riverside Cub Scout PAC 24 was chartered by the Riverside Presbyterian Church and PAC 24 has been in continuous operation since its charter. And whereas today, PAC 24 is currently comprised of 68 boys and girls in grades kindergarten to fifth grade and regularly meets to camp, hike, learn, and explore the world around them. And whereas annually, PAC 24 enjoys camping at the Riverside Scout Cabin in Michigan's Warren Dunes, organizes and holds a Pinewood Derby, and celebrates the anniversary of the Boy Scouts of America at their blue and gold banquet. And whereas, over its long history, PAC 24 has provided countless hours of public service to the village of Riverside and surrounding community, including planting trees and clearing invasive plant species from the area forest preserves. Now therefore, be it resolved, that the Village of Riverside Board of Trustees does hereby congratulate Riverside Cub Scout PAC 24 on its recent recognition as a 70-year veteran unit of the Boy Scouts of America and on being awarded the highest level of gold in the Boy Scouts of America's Journey to Excellence program, dated this 17th day of March, 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clarity. Gentlemen, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for presenting the colors. We appreciate it. Now that you know where we're at, if there's anything that you ever need or anything you see in the community that you think that we should be aware of, 
whether it's something in the parks uh, or a program that you think our, our recreation department should be looking at or whatever, please feel free to come forth and speak at this board. Okay, that is your responsibility as Cub Scouts. Thank you. We move on to the manager's report. Ms. Francis. Thank you, President Ballerine. I have um, two items that I wanted to make mention. Um, last week, uh, Riverside Economic Development Commission had a meeting, and at that meeting, I had asked Director Johns to ask the commission if they would be supportive of initiative of removing the fee for outdoor cafes. Currently, that fee is $25. Um, it's a minimal fee for something that really highlights and invigorates our central business district. And so they were very supportive of that initiative. So I will be bringing back to the board at an upcoming meeting um, an update to the village code unless the village board um, would uh, prefer not to have that done, um, but I think it'll be pretty significant. We noticed during COVID that that helped significantly our businesses, and also the $25 is very minimal in comparison to the addition of the outdoor seating, which brings in sales tax and brings in additional visitors into our central business district. Um, the other item that I'll be bringing back um, for further discussion is um, staff had asked for some additional guidance related to the green spaces discussion last week because Director Tab is going to be will be start working on the Selborne um, bid specs, and so if we plan on incorporating that into any of those specs, we need to update it and get those additional quantities. So that'll be further information for the board at an upcoming meeting. That is all I have for this evening. Thank you. We move on to residential, uh, resident comments for non-agenda items. Is there anybody in the public that would like to speak to the board? Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, I'm Jen Pokorek. I am one of your Riverside Public Library trustees. And I'm here um, on behalf of the library to ask people to fill out our survey. So we have published a survey, it's a link. It's in your spring newsletter from the library. It is on a postcard that you probably all got at home. It is also on the uh, library website. If you need a paper copy, it's also at the library. Um, this is our long range strategic planning committee trying to uh, canvas our, our uh, citizens to understand what you're looking for in the next three to five years from uh, services and a uh, program perspective from our library. So it is due um, March 31st. So we are really looking to try to get more people to fill that out. Every household member is um, welcome to fill that out. You don't have to be a library card holder. So please have everybody in your house fill it out. And if you take it online, you have an opportunity at the end to enter to win some local business gift cards. So there's a little incentive. So please ask your friends and family to fill that out. Um, and we appreciate your support. Anybody have questions? Trustees? No. Nope. Jen, thank you very thank much. You. Appreciate happy, it. Appreciate happy everything happy the library day. does for us. <laughs> Move on to the consent agenda. We have several items tonight. Uh, approve the voucher list of bills, March 17th, 2022. Approve the Village Board of Trustees regular meeting minutes, March 3rd, 2022. Review and file public works and finance, February 2022 monthly report. Review and file the Community Development Annual Report. Review and file Planning and Zoning Commission regular meeting minutes, November 22nd, 2022, and December 20th, 20, I'm sorry, November 22nd, 2021, and December 20th, 2021. Review and file Preservation Commission regular meeting minutes, December 9th, 2021. Review and file Historical Commission regular meeting minutes, January 24th, 2022. Review and file Landscape Advisory Commission regular meeting minutes, January 4th, 2022, and February 8th, 2022. Review and file the Planning and Zoning Commission special meeting minutes, January 5th, 2022. Review and file Planning and Zoning regular meeting minutes, January 26th, 2022. Review and, and file Riverside TV Commission regular meeting minutes, January 10th, 2022. Review and file Economic Development Commission special meeting minutes, May 18th, 2021. Review and file Economic Development Commission regular meeting minutes, November 11th, 2021. 
Motion to approve a special event application for the Riverside Parks and Recreation Department Easter egg hunt to be held on April 9th, 2022. A motion to approve a special event application for the Hauser eighth grade dance to be held on May 31st, 2022. A motion to approve a special event application for the Riverside Public Libraries Salsa and Salsa Party to be held June 3rd, 2022. A motion to approve a special events application for the Riverside Parks and Recreation Department Riverside Ride to be held January 4th, 2022. And a motion to approve a special event application for the Riverside Parks and Recreation Fishing Derby to be held on June 4th, 2022. Do any of these items need to be removed? Hearing none, um, there are some corrections. Yes, thank you, President Ballerine. There, in the meeting minutes, there are two small corrections um, noted. You have copies at your seat, um, and so it's highlighted in red. We tracked the changes um, for the board. So if there are no questions or... I don't have a question. I have another one, actually, on page six. Uh, the uh, second paragraph from the bottom, um, it mistakenly refers to Indian Gardens as Indian Head Park. If we could just substitute gardens in there, then that would be perfect. Do you see it, Ethan? Yeah. Okay. Three, okay. Four, um, it's about six lines up from the bottom. Got it. Okay. I see now. Okay. okay as long those, as we're correcting them. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank with, you. With those corrections, may I ask for a motion? Motion made with corrections. Motion by Mr. Gallego. Second. I'll second. Second by Ms. Marshazga. Ethan, if you please call the roll. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Marshazga. Aye. Trustee Gallegos. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans? Aye. Trustee Clarity? Aye. Motion passes, thank you. Um, I would like to just, for people in, you know, that download our, our agenda, take a look at the Riverside Community Development Department Annual Report. Ashley did a wonderful job. Um, this is the first time I've seen something um, from that department so detailed. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, we move on to department, boards, and commissions. Today we have our village forester, Mike Collins, who spent all afternoon burning Swan Pond. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks great. Mm -hmm. I did. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so uh, good evening, President Ballerine, Manager Francis, and village trustees. Um, I really appreciate the inv invitation to come and speak tonight. Um, I'm going to be providing a, a brief forestry update, but uh, before we get into that, I wanted to talk about something that really is near and dear to my heart, which would be our landscape volunteers. Uh, we're going to acknowledge a few real standouts, but also talk about some programming just to kind of bring everyone up to speed. Um, and of course, we'll do some questions afterwards, or if you have something pressing during, just let me know. Um, so with that, uh, you know, we call our volunteers the volunteers in the forest, which is really sort of a play off of our village moniker. In fact, we did some t-shirts a ways back and they're a big hit. It was a lot of fun. But, uh, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words, right? And uh, you can see this is a pretty hardworking group of people here. This was a hot, steamy June day up at Big Ballpark. We were actually weeding and mulching in advance of our 4th of July parade. And, uh, you know, just to give shout outs from the left to the right, uh, you can see uh, Sean McMullen, and then in the back there, uh, Ken Perlman, Jim Burns up front, uh, and then we have Joel Marhol, and then behind him, you can see Bob Finn, who he's everywhere in the community mm -hmm. and contributing, and then of course, Cindy next to him, and in the back there, Tom Guardi, uh, and then of course, we have Mark Ross, uh, which we miss him dearly. He passed away a few years ago, but um, you know, these are really uh, the landscape, hardcore landscape volunteers. They show up at almost every workday. And you know, outside of our other acknowledgments, I just wanted to kind of give them a shout out because we really appreciate what they do. And uh, you know, these landscape workdays have had sort of an evolutionary path. Uh, it's a great partnership with the Frederick Law Olmsted Society where we provide 
quality landscape experiences where people can come out, meet their parks. And then also we're working in natural areas, which has been a part of that evolution. Uh, and I give Holly Machina with the Olmstead Society a lot of credit because she kind of nudged me in that direction at a pivotal time when we had very limited resources. But, um, you know, and unfortunately the green pointer does not work on the screen, but the, the gentleman in the black shirt is Sean Sim. Sin, and he has done a lot with us in the way of consulting. He's a restoration ecologist and also a Riverside resident. Uh, just wanted to kind of give a shout out to him. And, you know, really uh, this partnership has led us to working in natural areas alike, uh, whether it be controlled burning like we had done earlier today. Uh, and in this picture, you can see them planting sedges along Riverside Road. The idea behind that is not only are we putting native vegetation back, but we're also uh, adding fuel so that we can use controlled burning, which is a great means uh, towards promoting native vegetation and discouraging invasive plants. And then, you know, another neat component about our volunteer programming is that there's a lot of youth engagement just beyond community engagement. You can see this picture of, uh, I believe these were four uh, young ladies from the Riverside volleyball team, and uh, they're planting a, a tree as part of the RB Day of Service, which we've partnered and worked with them, you know, minus the pandemic years, uh, to do a lot of interesting projects throughout the village. Uh, so not only you know, do we work with the youth, but we also work with scout troops, which has been very rewarding and interesting. Um, and really, we're just incredibly thankful for all this support. Um, you know, it means a lot to the village, and uh, you know, it, it's made a tremendous impact. So with that, I'm going to shift gears and acknowledge uh, a standout. And for those of you watching at home, uh, Carolyn Husson, uh, or as I like to call her, the Lady of the Long Common. Um, I was very <laughs> thrilled when uh, President Ballerine had reached out to Director Tab and had acknowledged that she's out there almost every day weeding, almost rain or shine, you know, depending on how bad it is. But, uh, you know, she has really worked incredibly hard on the Long Common and her impacts are, are so noteworthy. Um, you know, I first started working with her probably in 2009, but in 2010 she started tracking her hours and she's approaching almost 3,000 volunteer hours, which really is a $74,000 labor value for the village. And that's just using seasonal rates, which would be $15. If you use the national average, it would be almost double that. Um, and she's also donated a significant amount of money over this time period, approaching $30,000. And this has been for planting woody trees, shrubs on the long common in addition to perennials. And she's also donated from time to time regarding maintenance. Um, so, just to zoom in a little further, in 2021, she, she actually donated $6,000 and put in uh, 254 hours just in a single year, which I think is outstanding. And you can see that labor value and how much she's contributed over time. Uh, you know, but the neat thing to me is she probably prioritizes the lawn common over her own garden in a lot of instances. And, and all these donations, she and I always joke that really we're just trying to outcompete the weeds with, with perennials and, and other woody plants. So, um, you know, I really think she deserves to be acknowledged as an amazing volunteer. But I'm going to hold that thought because or I should say pause for a moment, because I also want to acknowledge the Frederick Law Olmsted Society of Riverside, and more specifically, uh, the landscape chairs, uh, <coughs> landscape committee chairs. You can see Cindy Kellogg on the left and Holly Machina on the right. This picture was taken when we were pulling garlic mustard out in Indian Gardens. Um, I'll never forget, actually, it was in this very building 17 years ago when I was first starting here. Um, but, you know, I, I had been out removing snow for public works and Director Houlihan at the time asked me, hey, could you pop into the Olmstead annual meeting and just introduce yourself being new in the community? And, you know, after the meeting, Holly came right up to me and said, you know, really, I, I want to do some landscape work days. Let's get some volunteer stuff going. And of course, you know, me working at Cantini previously, we had a pretty robust volunteer program. So I knew the value of that and was smart enough to take her up on that offer. Um, 
So since then, we've crafted over 160 landscape work days, and we, we do say craft them because they're meant to be experiences for residents to come out, meet their parks, their natural areas, and help beautify the community. And I think we've created an environment uh, that has allowed residents to really engage and buy in with the com community. And I think it's also you know a statement on the community itself and the historic nature with Frederick Law Olmsted designing the place. I think a lot of people move here because of what he created. So, um, you know, really, well, and before I get too far ahead, um, I would estimate that's probably about eight, 8,000 labor hours over those 160, which would equate to about 120,000. And again, using that national average, it would almost double. So uh, that has been a significant contribution. And then you look at what they've donated over the, the period of this 17 years, that's $63,000, which is incredible. Um, you know, really, it's so appreciated, whether it be trees, they, I think they've donated approaching 130 plus trees. Uh, they've donated for uh, perennials and sedge plantings, tools for work days. You know, to me, it, it's really inspiring how they contribute to us as, as an organization. And you can see the picture of Cindy Kellogg down below, uh, popping sedge plants into drilled holes with Roy Diblick, who's a pretty well-known plantsman throughout the area in the Chicago region. Um, and then just to zoom in closer, you know, in 2021, it was a pandemic year, so we were pretty limited in terms of who we were allowing to participate, but we still, you know, did quite an amazing uh, a feat of doing you know, I think it was close to 384 volunteer hours. Um, so, you know, that's a pretty significant contribution as well. Um, and, it, you know, I'm just always impressed with Holly and Cindy's dedication to the cause. And really, I consider all of them, Carolyn included, to be my friends, really, because we've gotten to know each other on a personal level. So it's been an amazing, amazing journey. And uh, with that, I just wanted to invite, uh, unfortunately, Cindy couldn't be with us tonight, but Holly is in attendance, as well as Carolyn. And I wanted to invite you up for recognition and, and just pass a little something along to you. Goodie bags. <laughs> Treats. Treats. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carolyn. Thank you, Mike. You bet. You're welcome to say something if you like. Uh, not necessary if you don't. The only thing I would say is, so we've known each other now since my youngest was like a baby. So just in the very, very beginning, uh, for me, being on the Olmstead Society, and just the, what we've done together has been excellent, but it's also been just a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and Cindy, if Cindy was here, she would say the same thing. And really, Cindy's a hard worker. I'm, I'm, I just, You're I just, I send out the people. So, <laughs> Cindy's really a, a hard worker. But it, it has, it's, it's been um, wonderful, and I think we're going to keep at it, right? We're not done. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think this is great. I mean, I'm retired now, and if I did not have the long common and your input, I would be sitting in front of the TV, stuffing my face like all the other old people and dying <laughs> up. So this is keeping me alive, and I think it's wonderful. Well, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Feel free to have a seat and I'll uh, finish up. Okay. All righty. So shifting gears towards our forestry update this evening. And again, I really appreciate all of your time. Uh, you know, just a, a brief update in terms of our five-year cyclic tree trimming program. We'll be trimming zone five, which is the yellow area. And the idea behind this program is that we're trimming each, five, each one of these sections annually over a five-year rotation. Uh, so within that trimming, uh, you know, we're, we're training younger trees, which means that we're pruning for good branch spacing. Uh, we're pruning the tree to improve its structure in the long run. So, uh, you know, we're making sure there's not codominant stems, broken branches, or any disease or insect issues. And the same would go with mature trees, but that's more removing deadwood and just preserving the health of these trees as they move forward. 
And, uh, you know, I think this picture really speaks volumes. Uh, it was taken by a tree trimmer that was about 50 feet up in a sycamore tree. Uh, I don't know how well you can see this, but you can see the branches sort of rotted. And below it, there's a very small car and uh, the house as well as a sidewalk. So uh, the idea behind the cyclic trimming program is a proactive approach to finding uh, these issues and, and uh, basically practicing risk reduction or increasing public safety. Uh, and then, you know, just to show you a quick picture, this is a, a photograph of some of the deadwood we would get out of a typical tree. This is over by Indian Gardens. But, uh, you know, it, it's vitally important to maintain these trees. And really, when it comes down to it, it saves us a lot of money in the long run in terms of storm damage and stuff of that nature. So we will be trimming zone one up top. Last year we trimmed zone five, which was uh, the first division, a uh, total of about 1,500 trees. So shifting gears to re, uh, removals, uh, you can see the picture on the right is actually of a diseased elm tree that we removed the other year. Uh, typically we remove about 100 trees per year. And you know, uh, last year we actually underachieved, which was nice, we we're at 95. Um, and you know, ultimately, a lot of it is driven by you know, public safety issues. If we find a tree that's hollow or needs to be addressed, we would remove it, but also insect and disease issues. As I mentioned, Dutch elms disease. Uh, we also dealt with emerald ash borer from 2014 up to 17, which was a pretty significant impact to the community. Um, but uh, moving forward, you know, basically one thing I wanted to talk to the board about was that um, you know, unfortunately, last year of the 95 trees removed, 40% were maple species. And I consider maples to be a bit of a canary in the coal mine as it relates to coal, uh, climate change. Uh, so uh, basically what I've been seeing is that maples, uh, you know, are being a very sensitive species, uh, just like me, um, you know, they tend to struggle when we have extreme flooding in the spring and those roots are inundated and in saturated soils. And then the pendulum swings with climate change where we go into drought conditions, the ground tightens and it also impacts the roots of these maple trees. And we're starting to see some significant decline in that way. Uh, not to mention, you know, as you can see the picture below, a pretty significant storm damage with the intensity of some of the storms that roll through down. Stuff that really, in my opinion, as a forester doing it now for 25 years, uh, I don't remember this level of damage. So I, in my observation, things are definitely increasing uh, in terms of that severity and, and the impact of climate change. And I think as the climate continues to shift, uh, we'll definitely have some challenges, especially with our older tree population. Uh, but, you know, so far we've been able to manage it and, uh, and move forward. And then in regards to reforestation, uh, you know, you can see we, we, we really focus in on species diversity. Like, for instance, if, if one neighbor has an oak tree, uh, the other neighbor would have a maple tree. You know, our idea is we don't want to plant either of those species. We would want to install like a tulip tree, like in this picture. Uh, and the idea there is to diversify each city block so that, you know, whether climate change, an insect or disease issue, uh, you know, we want to be able to take that impact and not lose an entire forest. So uh, we, we do practice species diversity and in 20, 21, we planted a total of 81 trees. This year in the spring, we're budgeted for 65. Uh, and we'll likely increase that number as volunteer operations go on in the fall. Uh, and then I, I also did want to just provide uh, an update regarding our WORTH program. For those of you not familiar, it's the White Oak Riverside Tree Heritage Program. And, uh, you know, I got to liaison or, or sort of put on, uh, you know, my squirrel costume and run around, run around the river and collect basically acorns from a lot of different white oak species. These are pre-settlement white oaks. And we have given them to uh, possibility place to grow onto two inch diameter caliper. And then we'll underplant these in, in, you know, around those river areas. And you know, the hope there is to preserve the genetic legacy that we inherited with Mr. Olmsted. Uh, putting something back as these older white oaks mature and decline will still have that genetic uh, diversity and legacy. Um, so uh, finally, shifting to restoration. Uh, 
Um, you know, Riverside Road uh, is, is an area where this all really began, and it started as Olmstead work days. Um, and then I think at the time, President Sells saw the progress made and was willing to invest a bit more in restoration. You can see this picture here. Generally, we have a wall of green buckthorn. Buckthorn is an invasive species that grows in our woodlands and chokes out our native trees. Uh, and you can see it's in fall color, you know, some of our native plants. So uh, buckthorn outcompetes them and also has a longer growing season, which makes things uh, very difficult. And it's, it's a it's definitely a force to be reckoned with. Uh, so you can see in the picture below that we actually cleared away all that buckthorn, opening up a view to the river, uh, and we've been doing control burns on Riverside Road as well as native sedge plantings in collaboration with the Olmstead Society. Uh, and it's, it's made uh, really good progress. I'm, I'm very happy with how that's come along. Um, also, Indian Gardens, we've started doing more restoration activities over there. Uh, we've cleared out some areas along the riverbank and started implementing sedges there as well. And we've done control burning in the past, in addition to buckthorn removal. But, you know, to steal someone's line, it's, it's very akin to painting the Golden, Golden Gate Bridge. By the time you get to one end, you have to start and repaint all the other. So, um, and then lastly, I just wanted to close out with Swan Pond. Um, for those of you who are around today, you may have seen a little bit of smoke and fire. We were able to implement successfully a controlled burn or ecological burn down there, um, which I'm very pleased. It was about a total of four acres that we were able to burn. And you know, for those of you not familiar with controlled burning, um, you know, a lot of our invasive plants have not evolved with fire, whereas sedges, oaks over time have evolved and have an ecology and a relationship where they can tolerate fire. So the more you can introduce fire to these areas, uh, the more you give natives a competitive advantage. And you know, I really did want to state to the board that I, I am very appreciative of you putting your foot forward on the Swan Pond area as, as a naturalized area, which really happened last year. But I, I think it'll be a very, very uh, challenging journey, but a very rewarding one. And I think for the most part, the residents really appreciate how it started to naturalize. Um, and then I, I did want to just share this picture. Uh, you know, one other thing we've been doing is treating for invasives. This year we'll be doing three treatments to knock back reed canary grass, teasel, uh, thistle, and stuff of that nature. Uh, you can see these brown patches. I just kind of wanted to share that, that picture as, to give you a feel for what these reed canary grass treatments are are about and you know we're, we're really just spot applying herbicides to control these so um, you know really I, I think it's going to be a very fluid situation you know especially with river flooding which will bring in more weed seed but I think getting these burns and controlling the invasives will really uh, you know create a, a beautiful park down there so uh, with that I just wanted to thank all of you for your time once again. And if you had any questions, I would leave you with this wonderful sunset over the displays. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Trustees, you. do you have any questions? I hope. Yeah. How long Please. did the, um, the fire take today? Uh, we started, I would say, around 1030 with a test burn. Um, and then I would say we wrapped up um, probably around three o'clock, that's when the wind shifted. So, uh, you know, you need to be conscious of where the smoke's going. So we had to stop at that point. Otherwise, I would have kept going, but. It was, it was a sight to be seen. I had some good pictures of it. Okay. Thank you. Great. Appreciate everything you do. Carolyn, thank you for everything you do. We really appreciate it. I, I, for the years that I've been driving down Long Common or Nuttall and see your bike, <laughs> parked against one of the trees and I'm like, okay, where is she? And then, you know, you could see it, you know, <laughs> hiddled in the corner. So we, we really, really appreciate what you do. I love doing it. I just love doing it. Oh, we appreciate that. And, and Holly, um, the Olmstead Society and, and your leadership and, and we, we, again, we appreciate everything that the Olmstead Society does. Um, and in recognition of, of that, uh, this board, has decided that we will donate the um, bench that's going to the Overlook uh, as a birthday present for the Olmstead Society for the uh, um, for Mr. Olmstead's birthday. So thank you very much for everything you do. Very nice.
Okay. Thank you. Um, Ron, would you like to speak about some of the things you have coming up? Sure. None of them involve fire. But <laughs> Still happy to share. Uh, good evening, President Ballerine, Village Trustees, Manager Francis. Uh, as you can imagine, I'm very excited to announce a few of our upcoming events uh, that were actually on the uh, consent agenda this evening. While the uh, department successfully navigated the pandemic by modifying events and creating new ones, we are ready to get back to our traditional offerings uh, offered in the, in the manner that they are traditionally uh, offered and that residents are used to. Uh, this begins with our egg hunt on April 9th, which starts at 10 a.m. sharp. Children should bring their own basket or container to collect eggs. Uh, everyone will have an opportunity to take their picture with the bunny. And uh, also this year, Girl Scout Troop 40054 will be offering a face painting fundraiser as well. So hoping for good weather, um, but it should be a good day out at Big Ballpark. Uh, also, our Riverside Ride is a great opportunity for families to enjoy a scenic ride through Riverside streets in a safe manner with police and fire department escorts. Uh, this is important because even after all these years, you can still get lost in Riverside. So uh, it'll be a nice way to kind of wind down the streets uh, in the morning. We'll also offer bicycle safety tips and have an expert on hand to inspect your bike along with your helmet to make sure that you're safe for the ride, but also the upcoming season. Uh, participants will meet at the St. Mary's parking lot at 7 a.m. and we will depart uh, by 7.15. Following the ride, you can go home and grab your fishing gear and tackle box for the fishing derby, which will start at 10 a.m. at Swan Pond. We're excited with the uh, Swan Pond renovations. It actually it will be a more inviting atmosphere uh, for fishing for the kids to come out and all that information uh, will be on our Facebook page as well. Uh, those are just a few. Those are just the upcoming events. Uh, we are looking to add additional events this year. Uh, we are looking to increase our sponsorship levels so that we can offer larger scale events uh, for the community. And those, uh, that information will be coming shortly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Melchiotti. Appreciate it. Any trustees have anything further they'd like to add? Okay, hearing none. Move on to the pending business. Um, we have an ordinance approving a variation for construction of a fence on a corner lot and street yard at 40, Kim, uh, 40 Kimbark. Hello. Francisco, please. Yes, good evening. Um, so the ordinance for uh, 40 Kimbark Road um, originally came up to, well, came to the Board of Trustees at the February 17th uh, meeting. Um, and the original proposal that was put forth by the petitioner was for a six foot fence that um, went all the way down to the property line toward the back of the house. Um, planning and zoning um, prior to that February 17th meeting recommended a denial for the fence um, due to some safety concerns and also um, just there was, um, you know, they felt that it was uh, just too tall for the corner lot. Um, so they recommended denial and it came to the board. Um, and that the February 17th meeting, the board um, uh, decided to, um, to go along with that uh, recommendation of denial from planning and zoning, but they also remanded. Um, a revised proposal back to planning and zoning um, for a fence that would be f that would project five feet off of the house um, it would be four feet in height uh, fifty percent open um, and it would go toward the back of the lot and um, toward the the garage and the drive um, pad uh, after the meeting planning and zoning uh, recommended approval of the revised variation. Um, to allow the fence on the corner lot and in the street yard. Um, and so that is the ordinance that you have in front of you tonight. Um, and again, it would be five feet, it projects five feet from the house. It encloses that side door on the south side of the property, goes toward the rear of the property, um, and it then um, encloses that part of the garage by the by the driveway and the alley. Um, it would also allow um, the petitioner to build uh, a fence to connect the 
uh, northern portion of the garage and the house to the neighboring property to the north, but there would be no uh, six foot fence um, on that north end of the, of the property. Um, so that is the uh, ordinance for the fence tonight. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Francisco. Yep. Um, anyone in the audience like to speak to the board before I open it up to the trustees? Simon Schumer, okay. Trustees? Mr. Pollack, do you have any questions? Because Yes, I do. Um, I had, uh, I, I, I'm generally in agreement with the Planning Commission's, Planning and Zoning Commission's recommendation on this. Uh, I had suggested uh, some clarifications to the ordinance, which I shared with Jessica earlier today, basically just adding conditions that state specifically that the fence will comply with the elevation that the petitioner had submitted to the Planning and Zoning Commission and, in the, and an exhibit that showed the location of that fence uh, extending five feet from the house and, and as Francisco said, enclosing the uh, rear yard on the, on the north side. Um, and I, I wanted to, uh, I had asked that they share that with the petitioner and I'd like to ask the petitioner if he is in agreement with those conditions. Mr. Scheinman? Yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement to it. I mean, Mr. Scheinman, if you could please step to the podium. Sure, I think you included a picture of the fence I'm probably going to put up there. So, what are we asking? If I'm are you, a, did, did staff share that revised ordinance with you today? Yeah, basically. And exactly. did you have a chance to look at it? Not the one that I saw from today, but from what we spoke from the last meeting, that it's branching off five, pretty much kind of how you drew it off um, from the last meeting, that it's five foot off and then tailoring back towards the garage. And a four foot tall uh, faux wrought iron fence. Yeah, the wrought iron is actually, we're gonna probably go with wood, the wrought iron. I was just having problems, especially uh, getting the gates because they are on back order. So I'm probably gonna go with the wood style, like open style that I believe, is this it with them? Yeah. So I guess you guys have the packet of information? I, I have um, Well, I, I'm, I, I still have the table. Um, thanks. Uh, I'm not comfortable changing anything from the Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation. They there, saw... Even during the meeting, there was never even talked about what style. They just said 50%. I just gave it to him literally at the I, end of I'm the meeting. I'm not comfortable making any changes from their, their recommendation. There was no... During that meeting, as he could say there, they never asked for anything about it. I literally talked to both of them at the end of the meeting and, and showed them that. So there was nothing even discussed about, you know, you came with the 50%. That was your personal opinion. There's no code on these things. I'm coming to these meetings just wanting to put a fence up. I feel like we're all community members here. I've got a bad taste in my mouth the way I've been treated and talked to by neighbors, kind of looked down upon at certain times when I'm speaking up here during the meetings. You guys are kind of, you know, voluntary people that are supposed to, you know, represent people in the community. I just moved here. I don't feel welcome. I don't feel great about it at certain times. The professionals that work in the, the environment of that with, with these codes and different things, I spoke with both of them on it. They had no issues with it. Spoke with Francisco on it. The main reason the fence even changed, nothing was talked about during that planning meeting period about it. Um, it was just gave it to them at the end. And then later talked to Francisco, the company I was gonna go through had the fencing, but the gate is on back order and COVID style and anything that if anyone's tried to order things and when people, things are on back order, I'm not trying to put up a fence and have no gates for you know, months at a time. So alternatively, you, know, you pulled out of the sky having 50% um, you know, sight lines, which is your personal opinion. There's no code or nothing in the writing of that. So if I follow suit with a different style of fencing, within the parameters. I, I don't know what we're speaking on, what the previous board had to even talk on. Thank you. Ashley? I, I was just gonna confirm what the petitioner had said. During the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, there, there was not a, um, a representation of the type of fence. Uh, the, the petitioner had come to us after the meeting was concluded with a recommendation for the 50% open at a four foot height. Um, and, and had suggested a, a metal fencing. He came to us later and said that it was gonna be challenging to source that material and opted for 
um, a different type of fencing that also would meet the code, which would be the cedar um, fencing with that same dimensions or, or minimum dimensions of 50% open. So I just wanted to clarify that. They, the Planning and Zoning Commission did not vote on a particular style I, I, of I don't remember seeing them seeing actually a fence when they were talking. Ms. Marshawska, yes. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify in addition, when we heard this matter on uh, February 17th, I thought you had requested that the material samples be presented at the special meeting of planning and zoning for the 28th. And Doug said that elevations should be supplied to planning and zoning at that meeting. And you, according to the packet that's on file, neither were, nothing was presented and Ashley just said that nothing was even discussed as far as that. So is it, does the uh, proposal that's even before us right now have the specificity that was requested to grant the variance? It's under my, it's my understanding that we sent down to the Planning and Zoning Commission that um, according to Doug's proposal it would be five feet off the side of the house and closing the side door and then a four foot high fence and the fence would have to be 50-50. There was no discussion of materials. Um, I believe um, we didn't talk about whether it be metal or whether it be wood. I, I'm, I'm pretty, I can be wrong. I, I'm, I don't remember talking about actual materials. Um, and the way it looks, I mean, I, I, the way it looks is he is, and I, I watched the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting and I don't remember them referencing metal or wood at the meeting. Um, so I, I think Ms. Monroe has, has agreed with that, but go ahead. You're right, we didn't talk about, at least my recollection is the same, we didn't talk about materials, but as Trustee Marsh Osgis said, we did specifically say that we wanted a specific elevation that showed the design and the materials to be presented to the Planning and Zoning Commission and, and to be voted on. We didn't want it, at least, I think this, was, I, I'm almost certain this was said out loud, that we wanted a specific elevation to be considered. Um, I don't know if I'm open to the fence that they showed us. It doesn't have any dimensions on it. I can't confirm that it's 50% open, at least in, in the, the way I think of, of, that, of that term and uh, zoning regulations. So I'm not prepared to vote uh, in favor of this if, if, if we've, we've got something new thrown at us now. I don't believe we have something new. Um, well, it is think, new to me. Well, I think we, we see the fence, and if the fence is 50-50, which would have to be, according to the, according to the variation, if it's not 50-50, it wouldn't be allowed. Um, so it's 50-50, again, I don't think we remember, I don't remember us talking about materials, um, just the actual spaces. Um, but any, anyone else? Yes, Mr. Hannon. Yeah, I, I share the, the, the recollection that President Ballerine has. Um, in looking at the ordinance that's in front of us, um, I think it reflects the discussion, uh, four foot high fence, 50% open street yard, five <clears throat> feet from the existing residence. Um, you know, the picture that was just presented by the petitioner, you know, appears to meet that. Obviously the inspection will confirm that it conforms to this plain language. Um, you know, I can attest that the uh, non-wooden fences are difficult uh, to obtain, um, having just waited on one myself. Um, so, you know, I, I think we've, you know, been through this process over now the second meeting. Planning and zoning has talked about it. You know, the ask was, was fairly clear. The minutes reflect that. And I think the ordinance sets out, you know, the, the parameters that, that we all agreed upon. Before I ask for a motion, um, Attorney Mars, um, this has been brought to the board as an approval. So it, it is now, doesn't have to be majority, it, it doesn't have to be four trustees, correct? Um, I was just looking at that. Uh, th there's a provision in the, um, <coughs> in the Illinois Municipal Code that says in municipalities under 500,000, you need four members of the zoning board 
to recommend any variation. Uh, so, so if we haven't gotten the four votes from the PZC, then we're back to uh, that situation that we had last time where it's not truly uh, uh, the recommendation um, per the statute. So we're back to needing four trustees uh, in order to approve it. Even though it was an approval from the planning zone. Commission. Right, it was, it was a favorable recommendation of three members, but not four per the statute. So, so it, it's kind of a nuance, I understand, but um, that's the situation. I just have a couple more concerns that I would sure. like to articulate. Thank you. Um, while on the one hand, I'm very, very much in favor and appreciate uh, the board wanting to foster a spirit of cooperation between residents and the board, um, I'm just not comfortable with the whole board's decision from the 17th uh, in substituting uh, our conclusion that forest is a busy street for the prior decision of the prior end zoning board that found four out of the seven factors uh, for eligibility for a variance were not met. And this was kind of based on this common knowledge that Forrest is busy. And we didn't have evidence before us of uh, comparing traffic counts, speeds, accidents between Forrest and all the other streets to decide, okay, is, is this really warranted here? So that's one thing. And for all the um, factors now to be met all of a sudden on remand, when the only thing that has changed is the parameters of the design, it's not the underlying hardship. It's not the underlying anything. There were no new facts brought into evidence at this special hearing on the 28th. So I'm struggling with that. Um, I'm also struggling with the fact that, you know, I thought we were specifically asking for elevations and uh, samples to be presented at the 28th, and that didn't happen. Um, so I'm mostly concerned uh, overall that the variant sets a precedent uh, where anybody who lives on a corner lot, uh, on a straight street, on a straight section of street, on a gateway, or an arguably busy street, uh, you know, on a corner lot can point to our decision here and say that they should be allowed to build a fence in their street yard too. And um, for me, it's just the cumulative effect of making exceptions like this that end up changing the look and feel and character of a place. Um, and obviously Riverside is known for its open space. Uh, so as much as I appreciate the good intentions, um, I don't think the evidence supports it. Uh, I'm just not comfortable setting a precedent that could erode Riverside's character under those circumstances. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, yes, Mr. Hannon. I, I, I disagree with uh, trust, uh, Trustees Marsh um, synopsis of the findings of planning and zoning. Uh, planning and zoning, it, it wasn't just the corner lot that they found, but they had three uh, unique findings that made it a hardship. Um, uh, you know, one of which was the position of the side door, one of which was a lack of a back door, and the final one was the, the busyness of the streets. Uh, you know, the commission, uh, you know, serves its purpose. We're not here to, um, you know, do our own fact finding. That's what the position, that's what the commission is for. Um, as Attorney Myers pointed out, it was a, you know, three to two vote. Um, which requires them, but you know, I, I'm not comfortable sitting here as a board uh, substituting um, what job that the PZZ is starting to do. They're the ones that do the fact finding, they're the ones that make the recommendations, and we vote the recommendations up or down. So, um, you know, to open that back up saying there was no traffic study, that evidence was insufficient, it was sufficient enough for the commission to vote on it, and that's their job. I'm saying their first decision, we second guessed. Thank you. A um, couple of other just facts is um, one of the things that they talked about is, is A, there is a traffic study that does say Forrest gets 8,900 cars down there today. So it is, it is one of the busier streets. The corner of Kimbark and Forrest where he lives is our fourth um, largest accident area. And he is abutted on both the front and the rear of his house by public access. 
which is very similar to the house that we approved um, back on Northgate, Mr. Kafka. He had the rear of being 26th Street and the front of being Northgate. Um, so the, there, there was a study, and I, um, but we didn't I believe, have I, excuse me. I'm sorry. I believe that the Planning and Zoning Commission did a, did a, a, a job uh, of looking at those different things, and then they saw the hardship. Um, but there, there is a traffic study that says that. It's not, I, we don't make it up. It's the COLA traffic study is, is, is in the agenda. Um, but would you like to? Well, I just, it wasn't in our packets when we made that, when the majority of the board made that decision, that's all I'm saying. We didn't all have it before us to say, oh, Forest is like this, but also this section of Burlington is like this. You know, we, we didn't have that comparative data to be able to make that conclusion. And it's not my, it's not a, I get it. the biggest point, it's not, you know, but it just is one of those things that but that data is made available. me pause. That data is available to all of us um, in our traffic study. Um, with that being said, um, I will entertain a motion um, to we the two, well, we're not, what are we doing? We can't, if we're- Motion to approve the- Motion the to ordinance. approve um, based the on the recommendation of the Planning and Zoning Commission, but we will need four trustee votes to make that approval. So do I have a motion? I'll make that motion. Motion by Mr. Hannon. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Clarity. Uh, Ethan, would you please call the roll? Trustee Pollock. No. Trustee Marshazga. No. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Yes. Trustee Evans. No. Trustee Clarity. Yes. 3-3 three, three, does not pass. 3-3, three, three, it does not pass. All right, so. I apologize. It's all good. Just so you guys know what you just did, I'll put a six foot fence from the edge of my house to the garage, and then I could put a six foot fence from the edge of my house on the north side from my garage, because it would be offset from her fence at least three feet away. I we understand it. It's all good. And again, I'm not bitter about anything. It, you guys are doing your best at what you need to do. Um, but for this process to take five months to get shot down on that, we're talking about five feet of space and some things we're making up. There's a reason why there's codes and different things, and I understand variances are different ways to go about. Um, but at the same time, I think uh, there's a lot of opinions here where we're finding facts and we're finding different things, but we're just going off what, what you guys like and compared to, it's subjective and not objective. So I, I, don't, I don't understand, but it is what it is. But either way, I wish you the best. Thanks for your time. So if I want that six foot fence, I just come to you and I apply for it tomorrow and I get registered. All right, we'll be all good. So that five feet difference is gonna be now, I'll just, I'm just gonna put that six footer up. So Thank you, Mr. Shaman. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. We're all good. Thank you. Move on to a new business. Yeah. Um, uh, so the next um, variation is for a um, property at 490 Uvedale. Francisco, can you hold on for a second? Oh, sorry. We have an ordinance approving a variation for construction of a deck five feet from grade and to allow an existing non-conforming deck to be enlarged at 490 Uvedale Road. Francisco. Okay, sorry, jumped the gun there. Um, no problem. So it's the, the property is at 490 Uvedale. Um, the petitioners are seeking a variation. Um, the current deck that they have in the rear of the property is five feet from grade. Uh, ordinance states that uh, decks can not be any higher than four feet from grade. And they also are planning, are proposing to enlarge the uh, deck by 238 square feet. Um, and the ordinance states that any non-conforming structures cannot be enlarged um, because it is non-conforming, five feet from grade. Uh, the petitioners are asking for the variation to be able to accommodate a hot tub in the rear of the property and also to enjoy the deck for their own personal pleasure. Uh, the current deck in the back um, is above a basement access door, so that door has been there I believe since I, I did a little bit of research, the door's been there since I think it was built. Um, it gives access to the basement, so the current deck is over that. Um, planning and zoning, um, you know, the, the, the hardship that they found was that the removal or relocation of that basement door would be cost prohibitive to the property owners. Um, and <coughs> the property owners would also 
um, essentially remove the existing deck, rebuild it with newer materials, with composite decking, um, and also up to code, more importantly. Um, and in terms of uh, the location of the deck, it is in the rear of the house. Uh, it's a double lot, so neighbors, if they would, were to see it, it would be very minimal. Um, it's right in the back of the house, so you wouldn't see it from the street. Um, and the Planning and Zoning um, Commission found um, you know, that the requirements had been met, and they recommended approval of the requested variation. Is there anything from the audience that would like to speak to this? If not, can I have a motion and a second to approve this variation? Motion Make made. Motion. motion by Trustee Gallegos, second by second. Trustee Evans. Ethan, would you please call the roll? Trustee Pollock. Uh, can we have discussion on the sure. on the motion? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, I, I'm in agreement with the Planning and Zoning Commission's recommendation, but I just wanted to point out that, and this was this was somewhat relevant to the uh, prior ordinance as or prior variation as well. In 2016, the village amended the standards for granting variations, and we significantly. Um, I think I said at the time, lowered the bar on, on obtaining variations. And we did that by adding, as, uh, as evidence of a hardship, we added language that says uh, that the presence of an existing structure or building or the condition of that structure or building is relevant to whether there's a hardship. Um, and in this case, um, the existing deck and the, the door below are features of the building that that justify the variation, and so so I, I'm comfortable with that. Um, you know, before 2016, one could argue that this would not have met the standards for a variation, but it, in this case, it clearly does. So I'm prepared to to vote uh, in favor of the Planning and Zoning Commission's recommendation. Thank you. Anyone else? Hearing none, Ethan, would you please call the roll? Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Marshaska. Aye. Trustee Galagos. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Motion carries. Uh, we move on to trustee reports and communications. Do any trustees have a report for this evening? Hearing done, uh, the, the board has a need for an executive session tonight. Um, we will be setting the price for sale or lease of village property and talk about collective ne negotiation matters. The board will not not convene and no final action will take place. So I would ask, the, I would like to ask for a motion and a second to adjourn to executive session. Motion made. Motion by Mr. Gallagher, mm -hmm. second. Second. Second by Ms. Marsazga. Ethan, if you please call the roll. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Trustee Marsazga. Aye. Trustee Gallagher. Aye. Trustee Hannon. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Clarity. Aye. Motion passes. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>